Welcome to Earth Chats. In this show, we chat to leaders, influencers, and organizations who are passionate about making our Earth a better place. We are all aware of the dangers of pollution and how global climate change could impact our lives. Join us and listen to the conversation with leaders in making our world better will share their stories, advice, and opinions. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram TV, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Make sure to join us and let's take hands to save our planet and make our world a better place. Good day, everyone, and welcome back to Earth Chats. Today, we are talking to Mark Dixon from the Strandlooper Project. Welcome to Earth Chats, Mark. Hi, William. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for having me on Earth Chats. It's a pleasure. I mean, thanks for taking the time to actually speak to us. Mark, it would be great if you can give our listeners some background about yourself and um, you know, how you became involved with environmental enterprises and the Strandlooper Project. Well, I, I suppose we don't want to go too far back, but I'll start off. So I did my undergraduate as a, I mean, agricultural in livestock science. And then I managed to jump ahead straight into a master's um, project at Rhodes University um, in the ecology and fishery department and did um, a, you know, a master's degree in that. And I've done some work for Kamla um, as a a scientific observer down in Antarctica for about five years and oh. um, just monitoring birds um, protection um, on long lining boats that were operating down there and then I've been I, I just love being out in nature and I've had a travel business uh, which I do guided nature tours some and how we got into um, the Strandlooper project was actually a, just a, a background in terms of one of the things we offer were in summer is snorkeling uh, tours. And one of our guests said, you know, there's a lot of snag fishing tackle on the reef here. And when you go diving, you do photography underwater, you, you sort of, it becomes white noise. So you know it's there, you pick up what you can and you, you just go in again and again. But, it really uh, struck a chord with um, us and organized a group of people that were like-minded to go and clean up the reef. And we were actually overwhelmed with um, how much we removed from a 100 meter transect. And that's where the scientist in me kicked um, in again and ended up um, trying to quantify how much tackle we went off of. And from that, we started the Strandlooper project. So we did try to get as regularly as possible, um, going and trying to get a monthly dive in. Conditions aren't always up to it here, so, but we've tried to do that. And from that, we've just sort of had a, a nice springboard into other aspects of marine research. Right, excellent. So the Strandlooper project, is, um, that is a nonprofit organization, right? We are a, at this stage a group of volunteers. We would like to become a nonprofit organization. Okay. We haven't registered. It's, it's, it's one of those catch-22 funding scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's, that's the next drive is to become more formal um, so that we can conduct a lot more elaborate research. Um, you have this concept of ghost fishing. I'd like to, you know, for you to explain to our listeners um, what, you know, what ghost fishing actually is. Well, ghost fishing is, it's the continual um, capture and um, killing of a marine species by some form of fishing equipment. So in the commercial industry, most people know ghost fishing through either the trawl industry, so a, a trawl net gets lost when it gets snagged on the bottom, the, the rips from the boat, and that then um, over time drifts loose, goes drifting through the ocean, and whatever swims into it gets entangled in it and eventually perishes, um, either from starvation, drowning. Um, and so that's the, the most commonly known one. Another one are crab pots. So you've got um, a 
people or a fishing company will drop down a whole lot of crab costs on a, a long line and does break off in storm condition or whatever it is. And so the, the, the crab pot, how it works, is you put a whole lot of offal or bait in there. The sink attracts the crabs in, and there's a hole which is very difficult for them to exit. So it's a funnel shape going into the, the crab pot. They go in, um, if that's now broken off, they stay in there, they can't get up, they perish, and then by virtue, they then become bait for more crabs. So it has this ongoing killing process. And then in the long line in industry, when a long line with um, hooks is lost, it's got bait on it. Um, it will catch a fish, uh, the fish will perish on that, it will be fed on by other fish and decay, and then you've still got a portion of it on the hook, and that then becomes bait for another um, fish species that will come along to eat that. And over our two and a half years that we've been doing research now, we've managed to um, collect samples of five different species of fish that have been killed from ghost fishing. So it definitely happens in recreational fishing. So Mark, it seems that um, all types of fishing are really uh, contributing to the problem. No, definitely. You know, it's, as, as soon as you lose tackle, um, it's, you know, it's not out of sight, out of mind. It's, um, it might be out of some people's minds, but it's definitely carrying on doing what it was designed to do and, and capturing fish. Amazing. So um, you touched a little bit on the diving surveys and, um, and, and the hiking. But um, tell us a bit more. What, what, how do you, um, you know, how do you do these surveys, and um, specifically about the Strandloop project hike? Okay. Well, let's start with the the dive. So we've we've identified three dive sites in in our area um, that we go and try to do regularly. So there's um, Hericus Point, which is our prime site, and that's an open ocean reef, um, you know, along the shoreline, the coastal shelf. Um, and then we've got um, Kingfisher Creek, which is the estuarine mouth and Sedgefield. And then there's um, near the Petita in the Niles and the Heads. And so what we do is we, we've established over the, um, the time a definite transect. So we, when we go back, we do the same transect each time. So we've got something quantifiable. We can say, okay, over this period, we've got so many sinkers per per meter or something like that and then when we and we remove everything that we can um, that's possible and so we then tally the sinkers the number of hooks the swivels the volume of fishing line and and a number of other factors just um, so that we've got this data base going up and uh, what's interesting is we've also been able to identify different types of fishing activity and we've managed to put that into different socio-economic categories as well. Um, you know, the reef snags tackle in different ways. So with your, um, your sports fishermen and your recreational fishermen, it's just out there to catch a big one for the fun of it and maybe take some of it home. They're using quite expensive tackle and, you know, some of the tackle we were covering is about 80 rand Per, per loss. Um, and then you've got your subsistence fishermen who are using lighter tackle. Um, and so the heavier tackle seems to the, the sinkers snag on the reef, whereas the lighter tackle, the hook snags in the organisms growing on the reef. And it's a major distinction there. So even the risk of um, ghost fishing is uh, can be evaluated in terms of socioeconomics of the fishermen. But yeah, so we go out, we try to go once a month, we usually go at low tide, and um, like I say, we capture everything and we get the data. And then, um, yeah, we've had some interesting things, uh, but we'll probably chat about that a little bit later. But yeah, in terms of the hike, so once we had accumulated about a year's worth of data, we realized we, we need to have this in context with the rest of the coastline and we wanted to see what was in place and um, you know garden route or the southern cape's got a beautiful coastline and we decided we would love to go from native valley to blombos but we couldn't do it all in one go it's close to 400 kilometers so in um, 2019 we did a expedition from blombos and uh, to wilderness which was just over 210 kilometers, and we did that in 11 days. And we collected a huge amount of data. So fishing debris, and then 
as well as uh, plastic, um, uh, washed up plastic debris on the beaches. And got some valuable information um, from that. Um, the main one is you could see the distinction where you have regular public access um, and um, as to the amount of plastic pollution on the beaches, as well as when you have got a marine protected area and the type of commercial fishing debris that's on those remote areas. So um, yeah, a, a nice balance and uh, it allows us to take our transect data and be able to look at how that fits into the overall picture. Oh, awesome. And um, the Strandkilper hike and the hikes? Well, so that, the expedition or the hike that we did, that was, um, you know, uh, we did one in May. We're busy planning our next one um, for October. And um, so the May one, as I mentioned, was from Blombos through to Wilderness. And then the one in October was, is going to be from Nature's Valley back to Wilderness. So about 185 uh, kilometers or something like that. Uh, along the coastline. Oh, that sounds awesome. So, um, results from these surveys, right? I'm, I'm thinking about, um, uh, uh, you know, um, were there anything surprising in the results? And then my other question would be, you know, um, are there some of the projects in South Africa or even worldwide? Because um, if I think about plastic pollution, you know, you always, it, see, it, 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 it grabbed attention and awareness because of, nature programs made about plastic pollution and stuff like that, but I've, I haven't seen anything similar on, um, you know, fishing tackle and, and, and hooks and stuff like that. And um, do you have an indication of how big the worldwide problem is? Um, so a very simple answer to your question, are there other studies? We've managed to find one study in Norway, um, which wow. is related to a, um, crab pots so like like our crayfish industry where you go and put a, a you know instead of fishing it out in Norway you throw a crab pot out and you get your crab and, and the reason the study is being done is to try and make sure that every pot has got the individual identity on so yeah long and short of it not a huge amount um, what has happened is Dr. Lowe Klaassen from the Niasna Basin project was really excited about our um, initial results, and she managed to implement two um, postgraduate projects through the NASA Basin Project, um, researching aspects of that. So it, it is something that has garnered some interest um, in, in South Africa, and we've just recently had contact from a fisherman in Canada who's uh, very intrigued with what we're finding and, and our research in that. So. Um, you know, you know, maybe it grows and uh, gets up. But that, so that's the, the, the nice side in, in terms of that question. What have we found? Um, so we've noticed some very interesting things. So if we look at the, um, the Heracles Point transect, we've had um, about 20% of all sinkers and tackle that we've recovered coming off one particular rock in a 100 meter transect. So, oh. so, you know, that rock's about two meters. It's got a circumference of about three and a half meters and it's getting a huge amount of tackle. So, you know, luckily the fishermen have listened to us and we've, we've seen a huge um, decline in the amount of uh, tackle that we get off that rock. But it just shows you that choosing your, your location where you're going to cast is, is actually vital if you want to not lose your tackle and um, save yourself a bit of money, but also, you know, protect the environment. So the, ne the next component that we started picking up was that in the high cast zones, a lot of the reef is being damaged by the line, um, both in the recovery process and in when the you know it's just waiting and drifting there. So you're getting your algae getting scraped off. You don't have any of your marine invertebrates growing on that. So you get these relatively barren sections of reef in the areas where the high cast zone is, and that's you know that's a major concern because as soon as you take away that component. Um, that's your grassroots level, so to speak, of your food chain and your food web. So you have this major knock-on effect in terms of abundance in a region. Um, 
So we, we've noticed that and we're busy doing studies and monitoring that. We're using um, six-point photography to, to monitor that. And then we started also start um, getting an idea that there was a component of lead poisoning. And this is something that's you know, sort of hinted at in one or two places, but um, it's not something that anyone, everyone knows that lead leaches. So I know we think it's an in, inert um, uh, metal, but it, you know, it does leach. And, um, and we think, well, it's a big ocean and it's going off, but we've actually noticed in areas where we've had these high accumulations of lead that they, that the, particularly the algal life, but the invertebrate life around those accumulations of lead is also um, depleted. So we suspect that there's lead poisoning and, you know, it's coming up with trials on how to do that. So there's trials where you can look at the, the leaching rate, but it's, we also need to have a trial that can identify particularly that that section of the reef, the organisms have, have been killed by the, the lead. So that is um, also a very interesting one that we found, and it's, you know, ongoing research is, is covering that. We're very fortunate in that we found um, two potholes in the reef next to each other, about six, seven meters apart. And the one was filled with exactly 100 pieces of lead sinkers, wow. and there was nothing in that particular pothole. It was barren. And obviously there was a bit of agitation, you know, as the current comes in, the rowing effect of the, um, of the sinkers, but we also suspect it's a lot to do with the quantity of lead uh, killing that off because the other pothole was flourishing. It was just absolutely amazing. And so we're also doing a series of um, uh, fixed point photography there. And we are, you know, we've, we've obviously removed the lead and we want to see how everything grows back um, at the rate of it. Um, and and that's, so that's, that's another exciting one. And then I think our other exciting thing that just happened by chance was um, we found, we, so we started doing fixed point photography and we took a photograph um, in a particular rock pool. And I kept on thinking, well, there's something different here because they were actually trying to capture the fish. Um, so it was more of a baited remote underwater video um, and to get the size of fish in the area and the, the population density and that and different species. And it kept on nagging me. I went back to an archival photo from uh, 2014, and I saw that we had this huge amount of coral growth. So that's quite an interesting one. We've seen the confirmation in certain sections of the reef, and we're trying to now evaluate what that is. How do you actually, um, you have these photographs, and I assume you also take videos and stuff, and you have to serve results. How do you go about in actually publishing these and getting it story out? So we, we focus on getting our story out through social media. I mean, it's a very powerful. Um, trend uh, and you know lots of people go for that so we've got all the platforms at Twitter Instagram the YouTube channel and uh, website and even blog posts so um, we are looking at um, publishing something you know more in a scientific uh, um, journal as well as we get our data from that but um, yeah I, I think we, we're very fortunate um, locally we've got a, a, a good following um, with, you know, both fishermen and uh, conservationists. Um, interestingly enough, some of the, the best response we've had has been from fishermen. They, they quite like, the, you know, um, alerting them to what it is. And we've seen a, a, a subtle transformation in tackle setup, so particularly amongst the uh, recreational fishermen. But, you know, we, we hopefully get things growing and, um, you know, as, as it becomes bigger and we, uh, um, you know, the next phase is to get a sufficient funding, you know, like the lead testing um, for lead poisoning, that sort of thing. We'd love to do water samples. Um, we, from our hike, we published that we went through two conservancies, so we, we submitted um, uh, two reports, one more technical than the other, to the two conservancies, both are loaded on our website, and, you know, it's a good indication of what we found um, and what potential mitigating procedures should be implemented in the future. Um, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot we can do, and um, you know, obviously, it, it needs some growth within the structure of the project to be able to facilitate all what we do. So it's, it's a hobby that's that's actually got a, got a lot of information that it's providing. Apologies for the short interruption, but I do need to mention something. We really need to raise awareness about the dangers facing our environment. 
The Earth Chat podcast was started as a campaign to bring people together to save and protect our planet for generations to come. To make it easier for everyone to access our content and the advice shared by leaders in our mission for a better world, we have created a web new website where you can access all our shows and featured articles. Visit us today on earthchats.bitmedia24.com where you will find loads of interesting and insightful information as well as tips and ideas of how you can participate in your mission of a better Earth. Here is that link, link again, earthchats.bitmedia24.com. Now, on with the show. Are there ways to make fishing um, more sustainable? We've had a, a, a retired engineer in wilderness, I mean, in Fetchfield, who's actually he's designed a series of half ounce and one ounce um, sinkers from, and he makes them from stone. So they, they are natural, so if you lose them, um, you know, it's not detrimental to the environment as a piece of lead is. In terms of the monofilament, um, I think, you know, the first thing is if you, I'll give you an example. We went in just after December and we went to our big rock that catches and there were six of exactly the same sinker right next to each other. And, you know, what it indicated was that some, and they were brand new sinkers. So this person had really gone into the shop and I, I suspect he was somebody from a country and um, gone into the shop, bought the sinkers, gone down and thrown them in. If after the second sinker, the fisherman had realized, you know, that's maybe not the place to cast my, my tackle um, and it would have saved four other sinkers. And I think this is, you know, what, what you have to do. There are popular places. You do get fish aggregations and that's why people are going there. But, um, you know, it's, it's looking at your method of tackle setup and how you want to catch those, um, you know, your target species. So some people are very keen on using spoons um, and because that's above surface and but you're targeting certain fish like your layer fish and, and that. So I think it's being more aware. Going, having a, a grapnel sinker on a rocky bed is not a good idea. And you know, so we've uh, uh, over 20% of our sinkers that we recover are grapnel sinkers. So you know, maybe reconsider um, using grapnel sinkers. They're fine for sandy bottom, but definitely not for rocks. Awesome. So, you know, um, when you say this, I'm thinking about, you know, um, what would the, the role be, or is, is there a lobby movement maybe for legislation in changing what can be used by fishermen and also, you know, maybe a system of licensing that can pay for some of this research or something like that? Has that been something in your mind? <laughs> uh, you know, if, if we were in New Zealand, so I've done a lot of um, fisheries work in New Zealand, so I, I know what the utopian model is, and New Zealand has got an absolutely sustainable model. Um, mm -hmm. Your fishing permit is expensive. So I don't know if you recall about four years ago, um, GAF was going to increase the fishing permit to from 1999 rand to 399 rand, and there was absolute uproar um, across the country. Um, you know, it, it was there were petitions from across the socio-economic spectrum because of the, the immense expense of it. Now I always say, if I had to go to a restaurant and purchase fish back then, it was about 80 rand. For a meal. Now you're looking at about 120 rand. And I'm not talking your takeaway fish and chips, I'm talking about, you know, a, a, a sit-down restaurant and that. Um, even a takeaway fish and chips is anywhere from 40 rand to 50 rand. So let's take that model there. You just have to go and have two portions and that's your license for a year, um, you know, used up. So to be able to go and catch fish on a daily basis for 99 rand is actually, it's for nothing. Um, most people are throwing away more than that in tackle per weekend. Uh, so um, it would be lovely um, because it would increase our um, monitors and law enforcement of our permit restrictions. And, um, but yeah, that, I mean, that's the utopian. Uh, you know, you'd have people getting checked more often, you'd have gear be checked, and people would probably be a lot more conscious instead of, you know, that, that once a year fisherman he comes down on holiday and the line's been sitting in the storeroom for a year and um, slowly perishing, and he comes out and it, it breaks off because it's, um, poor quality instead of him having you know, disposed of that. You know, the simple little checks like that sort of thing. And it's the same with the tackle. You know, you, you don't go on a, a dirt gravel road in sand in your Mercedes um, sedan. Um, you don't go and fish in rocky terrain with the incorrect gear. And 
So there, there could be legislation, um, but I think to implement it here, we've got bigger problems in the country to worry about than um, fishing. I really think it's, you know, you can enforce it, but you can also instill a natural desire to look after the environment. Um, and that's something that I think that's where South Africans need to go. Yeah, there's a study that showed that, you know, in South Africa, um, on average, fishermen that go down, and this is across the spectrum, and, uh, and uh, there's a lot of finger pointing in South Africa across the socioeconomic spectrum. It's, it's amazing what our research shows as who's to actually more at fault in certain um, components of fagging, lost ghost fishing, and that. But the, you know, in South Africa, for every 10 fish that are caught, only three are returned to the ocean on average. Um, Whereas, and, and I'm talking about line fishing from the shore, um, not talking about boats or anything like that, and this is in recreational fishing. Whereas as soon as you go to the States, only three out of 10 fish are retained. So it's a very different ethos in terms of the environment there. Um, and we need to adjust that. You know, the person that goes, catches five 20 kilogram fish doesn't need to take us home, especially if he's coming tomorrow. He, he should keep one and, um, you know, let the other four go. I mean, what do you do with 100 kilograms of fish? Um, and, and that's the, you know, that's where we've got to be very, very careful um, in terms of environment. And it's, it's no longer a sport activity, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a functional activity. Um, and it's a distinction as well. Well, I think, I think um, on that side, you're right. I mean, awareness and, and, and people realizing um, that it affects them and affects our world will help in that area. I mean, uh, if, if you talk to others, you always hear that, you know, they are also con uh, conservationists. But I think um, there's another problem, though, and that's the commercial side, right? And how do you tackle that, the problem of commercial fishing? I suppose their legislation is imperative. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? So I've, I've mentioned earlier on is that I, I worked as a scientific observer. And so a lot of places in South Africa, ironically, has the legislation for that. Every um, vessel should technically have an observer that goes on the vessel to monitor the fishing activity, both to protect marine mammals, marine birds, but also to check that they are not um, disposing of um, product. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's a, in a way maintaining the, the ethics um, within the industry. Um, you know, New Zealand, they put it, like, as I mentioned, I mean, they, they're the utopian uh, fishery. If, if, if you want to look after your fisheries, you, you just look what New Zealand's doing. So you have an observer on board, if fishing activities are over 24 hours, you have two observers of, on board. Now, the permit for that fishery covers the cost of those observers. Are those uh, observers one, independent? They, um, in New Zealand, they are, um, depending on where the fishery is, but if it's in New Zealand waters, then they are through the Department of Fisheries. Um, so that they've, they've got there. Um, so they supply. So it's, it's not an independent organization. We do have some independent organizations in South Africa, which I've worked for uh, one of them. But... Um, Oh, I mean, so they're, not, they're not being employed by the fishing company or that fishing, right? They, they um, employed by well, the third party observer. The fishing company, yeah, so the, ultimately the fishing company is paying for, for him to be on the, on the vessel. But no, that, it's not, they're not getting on. They, you want, that boat's leaving the dock. It's got to have a fisheries observer on board. Okay. Um, also. But then to make sure that there's no underhand um, collaboration between the fisheries officer and the, um, and, and the fishing vessel um, or company, when that... So the fishing company has to submit this catch um, document. The observer submits the catch document, and those get submitted to a, a, another um, uh, inspector when they dock again. And if there's, you will then do a sample of the catch. If there's a, a discrepancy of over 10% in the two reports, both the observer and and the fishing vessel, the uh, fishing master, are then um, almost under a, a legal investigation um, you know to, to find out why there was such a discrepancy but so that, it's, it's very rigid but it's I mean it's fantastic they've got a sustainable fishery um, it's one of the most sustainable fisheries in in the world and <clears throat> um, it's, it's a, a lucrative interest, uh, fishery for the country so it can work and you know South Africa I mean if we want to open up job opportunity here and look at our, um, capitalizing on our ocean that would be the first way to do, which would eliminate all these illegal um, vessels that are coming in um, mm. at, at night. So, but it's on the commercial side. This is interesting. So, um, Mark, onto something else: the coronavirus, and um, I think the coronavirus is forcing all of us to think about everything we do. But before I go there, I want to ask you <coughs> something else. Do you think the coronavirus and the, um, specifically the lockdown 
um, actually emptying the beaches now for you know more than two months. Um, do you expect? Uh, is this? A, is, are, are you eager to get out and to see what the effect of this has been on the actual environment, um, with you know less people actually going and, and obviously less waste um, um, happening as well. Well, there is. I mean, this this last two weeks for any person doing research in the environment has been a fantastic baseline study opportunity if, if you were allowed to get up. We've been very fortunate that <clears throat> a couple of us from the Strunthorpe project have had um, some essential services permits. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so we have been on the beach. We haven't done any diving surveys, uh, so I can't wait um, to do that. In terms of trash, it's, it's actually been disheartening to see how much trash has been washing up on the beaches. So, you know, we all locked up in our houses, we still consume and we still got plastic, it's still getting out and unfortunately it's all been washing up onto the, the beaches. So, <clears throat> um, you know, it's, uh, but I mean, as, as a study opportunity, it would tell us a huge amount um, either way. Obviously we would have expected to have less snake fishing tackle um, from shoreline uh, fishing, um, but we will definitely find more plastic because a huge component, and we saw this on our expedition, is a huge component of cleaning up of the beaches are one is municipal services, but more so the, the public going along with a little plastic pack, picking up what trash they can and taking that off. And you know, when we did our expedition, when you go through areas that don't have a high density population, there is unimaginable amounts of trash on the beach that have just washed up. And this is all stuff that's leached into the ocean through our river systems and then gets washed up um, by winds and currents. And as soon as you get to your municipal areas and your public beach spaces, relatively pristine, from clean to pristine. So back to the coronavirus, I mean, everybody are thinking their organizational models. I mean, um, for one thing, you've got the project that's a, that's a you know, um, uh, basically a non-profit project. And then you also have your tours and your business um, um, side. Um, <coughs> and, you know, we all have to think about how the coronavirus affects us. Um, do you have any new ideas or plans in this regard or any thoughts? Yes, definitely. So, um, my tour business, you know, we do nature tours and, and hikes and birding tours, so we are a small group. So our marketing is going to be for an isolated experience, um, and, in, and that's what we offer anyway. So, you know, once somebody comes on, uh, take our five-day backpacking tour, once you're on that, you really have an isolated little group going from venue to venue, um, and, and without any interaction with other people, um, you know, as I I'm with the guests and then also the catering and my wife does the backup services. So, but it's, it's so our marketing will change to offering a, a isolated experience. Um, the transformation is obviously digital. Um, you know, we have started some uh, yeah, e learning um, platforms, uh, sharing our nature experiences as well, and some of our research. And so that's something that we'll just have to uh, build up as we go over the next couple of months and, and get that online um, and hopefully be able to capitalize on that as well. But if not, just have a bit foremost in people's minds um, as to what we can offer um, in terms of our, our dining experience. For the Strandlipa uh, project and our research, um, we are volunteer based um, at this uh, stage. And we'll just have to make sure that our volunteers are healthy. We do dive, so most people are, you know, you're underwater. If you're not feeling good, you're definitely not going to be coming diving. But, um, yeah, we're out in the ocean, and it's, it's a, a healthier place, I think, than uh, going shopping more. That's for sure. So, um, Mark, if people are home sitting there and they're thinking, oh, I want to get involved or want to contribute or donate or sponsor, how can they do this? Um, well, I, th I think the first platform would be to visit our website. Um, you know, we've got our contact details there, so the email address and my, my personal telephone number. And um, they can then contact me and we can discuss how to, to do that. Um, and, yeah, I mean, what, you know, whatever, you know, even if, yeah, whatever assistance is um, offered, we'll be, uh, very, we'll be very grateful for. Um, but yeah, I think that's the first platform. And then if they want to learn more, I mean, obviously contact us, but yeah, definitely visit our um, digital footprint and um, uh, find out more about us. So if, if we look at the Strandloper project, it's uh, strandloperproject.org, www.strandloperproject.org. And then for the uh, hiking tours and burn tours, then it's um, 
www.gardenroottrail.co.za. If you have one message for people at home about the environment and um, how they can make a difference, what would that be? One essential service provider that everybody forgets about, but their whole life they've been supported by, and their families before and future, and that's the, the, the environment. And I think we have to be more um, cognizant of that essential service. You know, it provides us our oxygen, our water, our uh, temperate climates, and, and that sort of thing. And be cognitive of what you use and what you do. Think what happens when I let go of that container, wrapper, or whatever. What is going to happen to it and what's it going to do to the environment? It doesn't just disappear in your dustbin and it's never to be seen again. Where is it going to? And then by the same token, when you purchase something, what was utilized from the environment to produce this? So a lot of people don't realize, but a pair of jeans, for example, depending on the brand. So some brands have been um, worked hard at this, but between 16,000 and 32,000 liters of water are required to make a pair of jeans. Now, you know, in, if, if predictions of going into drought are big and, and, and real, you shouldn't be having a pair of jeans for every other day. Um, you know, it shouldn't be a fashion item. It, it, you know, be cognitive of the impact it has on the environment. And it doesn't matter what it is. Um, you know, just rethink your use um, and the impact it's going to have on the environment. And then so that we'll always have those essential services provided to us. Mark, that's awesome advice. Thank you very, very much. Um, thank you also for spending the time. It's been a pleasure talking to you and um, I'm sure our listeners will find this interesting. No, well, I hope so. And yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And yeah, maybe we get a, a chance to chat about something else um, in the not too different distant part uh, or future, should I say. Um, yeah. Thank you for listening to today's show. We are grateful for everyone listening to our podcast and appreciate your interest in saving our planet. Please be sure to subscribe and follow us on the links below. It would also be extremely helpful if you could share the show and all your links with your friends and family. Bless all of you and bless our earth.